Good, thank you. Welcome everyone to Faith Builders Family Church. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to, to be up here with you guys. Pastor Dan and Nancy are enjoying their time in England. Uh, they will be back next week. Um, they've had some great services. Uh, last night when uh, Nancy sent me a text, uh, they had already done 15 services in six days. Um, and they have two more that they're doing right now. And, and dad actually just texted me right before we started service and they were going into those last two services. So they're having a great time. Um, Nancy wanted me to tell you guys that she loves you and dad wanted me to tell you guys that he misses you. So put those things together. They love you and they miss you. And um, I'm sure they're, they're definitely looking forward to coming back and letting you guys know what a great time that they've had. Um, and I'm, I'm equally blessed to relate back to them the great time that we've had with them not being here. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a mean way. Um, they are great pastors. And I think the, the, the true mark of a great pastor is his ability to leave and you not notice that you can still be just as blessed as if he was here. That is not his hands that have to be laid on you for you to be healed. It's not his sermons that have to break through to you know, the rockiness in your heart. It could be anyone in this building who can minister to whatever's going on in your life. And those are, that's the greatness of our pastors because they're walking in Jesus' footsteps and they're teaching us to do the exact same thing so what I want to talk to you guys about this morning is looking to Jesus. And uh, if you guys want to turn ahead of me, we're going to be in John chapter 3. And I've, I've kind of been reading this story on and off for the last six or so months. Um, Todd will appreciate this. We went on a walk, and I didn't know how walking could be difficult so it was my first ever hike, and I was looking forward to it. You know, five hours, just walking, yeah, that's a piece of cake. I didn't know that walking was walking up and back down and sideways and back around yourselves, making eye contact with a bull. <laughs> but I had a great time. But what kind of came out of that walk was, you know, we had a conversation about being born again. One of the fun things that going on a long walk can do for you is give you a lot of topics to cover. And we covered a lot of topics that day. And so my heart was just tuned into, you know, how do you answer that question of why must we be born again? And Nicodemus had that same question when he went to Jesus. Why do we need to be born again? We've got your scriptures. We're children of a covenant. What's this whole born again thing about? And Nicodemus is very much like us. And that's where I have to put you guys into his shoes this morning is we spend our lives acquiring knowledge. We spend our lives experiencing things that knowledge brings us. But it all comes to a head in Jesus. It all comes to a stop in Jesus. And what Nicodemus was looking to do was validate himself. Validate the teachings of his fathers and his father's fathers. Validate the teachings of the Pharisees. Validate the teachings of all, all the things that they had going on in Israel at that point in time. And he didn't get the answer that he was expecting. He didn't get validation. But he got truth. And truth always comes to us when we least expect it to. Because we don't often go to Jesus looking for truth. We know that that is what he is. 
but we kind of circle around him and, and go, okay, what, what I have, what I know is good enough. But, you know, it, and dad tells this story about himself a lot is that he had to actually go look in the scriptures one day to see if what he believed was actually there. And he found on more than one occasion that it wasn't. And we have to do that same thing. And that's what it's so important as believers that every once in a while we stop, we, we assess what we know. And we let Jesus teach us. So we're going to take John 3 and we're going to break it up into a couple of blocks. So John chapter 3, verse 1, and 1 to 3 says this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So let's start here. Nicodemus. His name means victorious among his people. And he was a ruler. So his name meant what he was doing. He was ruling over people. He was a teacher of these people. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus' name is Jehovah is Salvation. So you have victorious over his people meeting with Jehovah's salvation. So this ruler who is meant to bring or at least introduce people to salvation came face to face with it. But it's hard sometimes for us to see who Jesus is because of who we are. Nicodemus was a ruler, so he should know exactly who Jesus is. He searched the scriptures all day, so he should know who Jesus was. When Jesus stood in front of him, he should have known exactly what Jesus' name meant and what he was there to do. But Nicodemus had the problem that we all do. We're natural people with natural leans, natural bends, natural talents. So by saying to Jesus, hey, we know that you are sent from God because no one can do the things that you do, he was still dealing with his flesh. Because our tendencies are still always to deal with our flesh. Jesus, that, that bad back that you dealt with yesterday, man, nobody can do that except he's from God. That man with leprosy that you healed, nobody could do that except they were with God. Still dealing with physical things. And Jesus tells him, <laughs> I always found Jesus' reply just kind of weird. This man just gives you this great compliment. We know you're from God. No one's ever said that to Jesus. And nobody for the rest of the Gospels will ever say that to Jesus again. We know you're from God. But being from God isn't just you're sent with a good word. Being from God isn't just you have abilities that other people don't have, Jesus. But Nicodemus can't define what being from God is. He's never seen it. We've never seen it. And his reply goes like this. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does me telling you that I know you're from God have to do with me seeing your kingdom? But Jesus is saying, you see what I do to your physical body. But 
there's something deeper I've got to get you into. You think you're a part of a kingdom. You haven't even seen it yet. If your knowledge of me tops out at me healing your body, you haven't even come close to knowing what the kingdom of God's about. And it's not that... It's not that God does not want to heal your body. But he wants you to see that you're part of what he's doing. Is your body included in the kingdom of God? Absolutely. Is your healing important to him? A hundred percent. But if all you ever do is run from multitude to multitude to multitude trying to get healed, you don't even know what you're there for. I want you to see this kingdom. I want you to take hold of this kingdom. I want you to be a part of what I have going on. Verse 4 through 8. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of this spirit. And you might look at Nicodemus' reply and say, well, that's fairly ignorant. Nobody can go back into their mom. (laughs) But he's still dealing with what's natural to him. I was born of my mother. I don't know that she's going to want to take five feet, 11 feet of me. (laughs) She can't. And even if I went to my mom and said, okay, I talked to Jesus last night, and he had this really strange idea that I need to be born again. So here's what I interpreted to happen, is I've got to figure out how to get back in there and to get out again. Because it's what's natural to us. But being born of water and the spirit, it's talking about the word. Being washed by the word. Being made clean by the word. And John 15, 3 says this. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So what he's trying to get across to Nicodemus is you need to be born of my word and my spirit. Because Jesus was born of the word and of the spirit. And it's it's a it's it's a strange idea, but it's not one that's uncommon in the word of God. Because John, or excuse me, uh, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10.1. He says, Moreover, brethren, do not, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The people in the cloud, and the, was, was, that was the spirit of God. And going through the sea, that was the water. So there is a history of being born of water and spirit, already in the word. And for a man who spent his life in the, in the word, he should have seen that. And that being born of the, the, the water and the spirit was, I have to take you from being slaves to being a kingdom people. And no one had ever done that before. No one had ever taken uh, you know, millions of slaves and said, hey, we're going to make our own kingdom. 
But that's what God did with the Israelites. And one thing that we often forget, too, is that there were Gentiles in that cloud who crossed that sea along with them. So just as Paul's fathers passed through the cloud and the sea, our fathers passed through the cloud and the sea. You see, God's heart has always been for people, not peoples. And there's a huge difference there. Because we read the scriptures a lot of the times and we see, okay, Israel, he's dealing with Israel. Okay, let me flip a couple pages, still dealing with Israel. Man, where am I in here? And we might have been playing the background, but we were there. We had the same access to God as Israel did. The same word that they heard coming down from that mountain, giving them the law, we were there. And that's why it should have been so easy for Nicodemus and it should be so easy for us to see ourselves in the word of God. As a people who needed redemption. As a people who needed to stand before God with all that we are and take on all that he is. And I want to give you two verses here. Because to me, that born again experience is just about you were something. Now you're something else. And Deuteronomy 24, 18 says this. But you should remember that you were a slave in Egypt. You were a slave in Egypt. That's not who you are anymore. You were a slave in this world. You were a slave to sin. You were. And what we do sometimes with were is change it to is. Or whatever the proper grammar word is for that. Can somebody come and turn the camera a little bit? Should be flag to flag. Sorry, people at home. (laughs) Good. All right. Let me read the rest of that verse. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. And that thing was taking care of the widows and the homeless, the fatherless and the foreigners. I can take care of all of those people being Israel because they enter into the same promise. You know, when when our fathers crossed through the sea, God didn't say, hey, here's a separate cloud for you guys. You guys can walk across. Let me get all my people across first. It might be a little bit muddy when you walk through here because, you know, you're just not as important as my people. No, they walk through on the same dry ground, in the same cloud, the same heat that came from, from God at night. Our salvation histories are the same because God doesn't change. And in Ezra, he says this, and this is after they were in Babylonian slavery. He says in Ezra 9, 9, for we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage. But he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And the word for the the definition of redeemed in, in Deuteronomy there is to release, to preserve and to rescue. And the word there for revive is preservation of life. So you once being a slave, you can't receive what I have for you. All you know is being a slave, making bricks. And even in your your Babylonian slavery, all you know is being slaves, having no manner of importance 
just being dumped in with a bunch of other people who were taken captive. But God comes along and says, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to revive you. I'm going to preserve your life because what I have for you is so much richer than you'll ever know as being a slave. Because there's no prosperity in slavery. There's no deliverance in slavery. There's no life in slavery. But there's life when he comes to redeem us, to revive us, to repair us, to make us fit for his kingdom. And this is what Nicodemus should have been teaching the people all along. Preparing them for the Son of God. Because God has left all these breadcrumbs of salvation. And we got to be like Hansel and Gretel and just follow it. Because it's not going to lead to a, a witch's cave. But it's going to lead to God. How he prospers people. How he heals people how he redeems and saves us. Verse 9 to 13. And I'm driving towards uh, verses 14 through 17. That's where the good stuff at. In verse 9 through 13 says this. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Something weird goes on throughout this chapter with Nicodemus. He says less and less as they get more and more into this subject. And you might think, well, maybe Jesus is just dominating the conversation, but it's, it's a little bit more than that. Nicodemus has nothing to add to this conversation. And that's sometimes what it's like when we run head first into, into God and in truth. We have nothing to add to the conversation. But he has a lot to add to us. Nicodemus went from making this statement about what he knows to question, question, silence. what he knew was so small and and we have to humble ourselves too to just realize that when we run into God what we know is so small and it's perfectly fine because what I don't hear in, in any of Jesus's responses to his questions is ridicule or scorn there's a little bit coming up, but it's not very long. But he's able to get Nicodemus to validate what he has to say. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And that question there that Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel? The reason that was so important is, if you guys remember what we talked about, Nicodemus, ruler, victorious over his people. The people of Israel were living off of Nicodemus' word, off of his teaching. And very quickly, Nicodemus found out how deficient 
he was. And if the teacher is deficient, the students are even more so. This man teaching salvation, this man teaching the word of God, should have been able to present people fit and whole because that was their covenant. But if you, if you think back to any of your stories that you know about Jesus, who was coming to him? Broken people. Destitute people. People who the word should have been nourishing. People that the word should have been making whole. But they came with every manner of disease, the Bible says. Do you know how strange it is to have an entire nation where every manner of disease that existed at that point existed? And there was a word for it to heal every single one of them. There was a word to heal leprosy in their law. And Jesus goes on to say only one person who was a Gentile was ever healed of leprosy in the entire lineage of the scriptures. And I believe like for me, that's why it's always been such a difficult thing to acknowledge being a teacher is because if people are deficient it's because of the teacher. To some extent, you do have personal accountability to yourself. But for Nicodemus and the people at this time, they had nothing but to live off of the word of these people. They didn't have mass printed Bibles. They could go home and pull out the scroll of Isaiah. All they had was synagogue, temple, and all these things that should be making them well. That wasn't even getting them close. So when we come to God and, and, and we need healing in our body, God is not angry with us. He's not saying, didn't Pastor Dan teach that last week to you? Why didn't you go home and study it? No, he's gracious. Well able to heal. But we have to take it upon ourselves as well to get strong in the word. To make it our food and our drink. Because in those times where you need the word, it will be there. You know, Andrew Womack used to tell this, uh, this story about, you know, what, he's, what he would do at this time. And if he spent all of his time, he would, he'd talk about the show, um, The Roadrunner and The Coyote. And so he basically goes, you know, if, if I spent my, my day just watching The Roadrunner and Coyote and I really need the word of God to come out and all that comes out is meat, meat. I'm in trouble. And that's what was coming out of people when they come, came to Jesus. Meet me. Sorry, Jesus, there's nothing in there. There's no scriptures living in me that should be giving me life. There's no scriptures in me that should be making me whole. So when I come up to you and in the prayer line, Jesus, and there's millions of people that you still need to lay hands on, and I just go, just came to shake your hand. You're doing great work. And that's what our lives should look like. How do I become a part of this work that you're doing, Jesus? Because your word is enough. Verse 14, and we're going to read this story that Jesus alludes to, because I think it's a great story that you all need to hear. And verse 14 says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so 
must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I think that those four verses belong to each other. You know, I know no one's going to go to a football game and hold up John 3, 14 through 17. Because it'll just look weird. But those scriptures are so good at holding each other accountable. That Jesus is first lifted up before he's given. And the thought that I was thinking when I was just going over those verses is, as a parent, I don't give my best gift first. I separate it. Because I want my, my child to understand how important it is for me to give them that thing. You know, I don't say, hey, here's your laptop. Oh, here's some socks and some underwear behind it. Take the socks and the underwear first so I can underwhelm you. Here's the common stuff. The stuff that was, you know, pack of five for 10 bucks that I bought last minute on Amazon because I just totally forgot that all your socks are holy. And then I say, here's this great thing that I have for you, that I saved up and reserved for you. The thing that you have to wrap with special paper just so you don't forget where it's at. Because you want your child to understand how big that gift is. It has to be lifted up first. So the story I want you guys to turn to is Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Numbers 21, 4. And I'm going to take a sip of water real fast. And it says this, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. That's a heavy thing to say to God about his provision. God, we were starving. We cried out to you for food. You gave us food, and now we're just calling it worthless. I got to eat it every day. You know, this man and quail taco just doesn't taste the same anymore. This man and quail hot bread sandwich just doesn't taste the same. Just tastes worthless now. And we can do that with his word. That's what they were doing with his word. Calling his word worthless. We look at it as just saying, hey, this bread that dropped down every day was worthless. No, it was his word that was worthless to them. Because he told them, hey, we're going to go from here, we're going to make it to here, and you're going to be in a land of milk and honey. We don't want to go. You can't make us. All right, well, let's do a couple laps around the desert. Let's go hike in with Todd. <laughs> and they went on a 40-year hike for a trip that would only take... I think it's about 11 days, 40 years, every day walking up to the Jordan 
and going, we could be on the other side of here. We could be on the other side of here. We could be on the other side of here and never being able to take a foot across. And your life may not be stuck in a, in a 40 year hike, but it's probably stuck in depression. It might be stuck in defeat, in anxiety, in worry, in care. And these stories are given to us as an example of how not to get stuck. When God says, go over, you say, let's do it. I don't know where we're going. It sounds great. Let's go. But it comes back to trusting his word. And if you can't trust the word of the one that you're going with, you'll never get where they're going. You know, the reason why I could finish that hike with Todd, because I trusted the word of the person I went with. I trusted the experience of the person I was going with. That when we ran into that bull and my brain is, yeah, let's keep going. He's all like, yeah, no, let's go around this hill. Let's lose sight of this thing so he lose sight of us. That wisdom wasn't in me to take that journey. But Todd says, let's go around the hill. Let's go around the hill. Bull never bothered us. Me by myself might not be here this Sunday morning. <laughs> or I might have a new hole in my arm or something, you know. But when we go on these journeys with God, it's because we can trust him to get us where we need to go. He's left these breadcrumbs of truth of, hey, Abraham went on a trip with me. I got him where I wanted him to go. Moses went on this journey with me. I got him where he needed to go. All these heroes that you look up to, even our modern heroes, they trusted me to get them where I wanted to go. And I will do exactly the same thing for you. Verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And isn't that what we do a lot? God, I got myself into trouble. You should probably get me out of it. You know, me and the boys are having a, a chat, Moses. We said some bad stuff about you. And we're totally sorry. But since you're so tight with God, why don't you just ask him, you know, it, it's, if it's not a big deal for God, you know, just, just take the snakes away. And I love Moses. So Moses prayed for the people. There was no ego there. There was no anger there. He took the request to God because that was his role. As their intercessor, that was his job. And Moses had every right to say, nope, you spoke bad about me. Deal with the snakes. Because it's what we would do. When people cut you down and people say bad things about you. We use that. What's the good old scripture we use? You reap what you sow, right? Having nothing to do with people reaping back things into their lives. Because God is a gracious God. And God wants to heal those hurts from people and in people. So when they do come to you and they say sorry, even if you know they don't mean it, you extend forgiveness to them. 
something will catch up to them. I'm not saying that there's no, no consequences for what people say to you. But we don't have to stick around and enjoy what happens to them. We forgive, we move on. In verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone, say everyone, who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And here's what I really want to put up, pull out of this verse. It didn't matter who you were or where you were. If you were on the outside of the camp or if you were on the inside of the camp. You look at that serpent and you lived. Could be a stranger on the road. Nothing to do with Israel. Just going on a journey and a snake bites you. And you go, what's that thing shining off in the distance? And power is there to heal you. Because the word said everyone. Not just the people closest to the serpent. Not just the people within eyesight of the serpent. And that's what's so cool about this word, look. It had more to do with just your eyes. If you could perceive it, if you could give attention to it, and perception is done in the heart. So there might be some people close enough to see that thing, get bit, and go, okay, I'm going to live. There might be others so far away from that thing, and they just go, I know what Moses said, and he said, if I just look at it, if I just perceive that it's there, I'll live. And that's how easy salvation is. If I just look to Jesus, if I just perceive that he's there, I may not know all the stuff about him. I may not have Nicodemus' wisdom. I may not have the scriptures to back me up. But because he's lifted up, I live. And because he's lifted up and you believe God's word, and that's what they were doing at the end of the day. They believed God's word and they lived. Had nothing to do with that serpent. But God said, hey, here's this thing. Look at it. Live. And only God has the power to lift a thing up and give you life. And what Jesus is relating back to Nicodemus through this story is that as I, the son of man, am lifted up, I'm lifted up so you can live. And not just have a natural good life, but have an eternal quality of life. So that you can be born of the spirit and water. So that you can be born to see this kingdom so that you can enter into this kingdom. And what my heart tells me is after this conversation that Nicodemus had with, with Jesus, that he changed his teaching. Because Acts will go on to tell us that many scribes and priests and Pharisees came to believe on Jesus. This one encounter with Jesus not only changed Nicodemus, but everybody else who he would teach. And that's what our teaching does. It points people to life. And if it's not pointing people to life, it's pointing people to those snakes that are constantly biting at you. And what I... What I firmly believe sometimes is that our teaching is is more centered around, around go chase down those snakes in your life. Go chase down those things that are nipping at your heels all the time. 
and people are dying. They're dying because what they should be looking at is right in front of their faces. They should be looking at Jesus. But yet they're in the bushes going, okay, where is that secret sin at? I know it's here somewhere. Where is that sin that's besetting me? It's not letting me run my race. But we point people to Jesus because there's life there. And it's the only source of life. And because it's the only source of life, why do we try to deal with the death parts of our lives? It's going to get swallowed up at some point. So my encouragement to you guys this morning We're born again so that we can say, I once was a slave. Now I'm in a kingdom. I can see it. I can perceive it. I have keys to it. I can unlock salvation. I can be delivered. I can be made whole. I can be made well. And I can share it with my neighbor. The kingdom's not just for people who come to church. The kingdom's for all the people who are on the outside of the camp going, well, what is that? And we get to come alongside of them and go, well, that's Jesus. I'm going to let him tell you what he knows about himself. Because what we know pales in comparison to what he knows about him. But we get a great opportunity to sit at his feet and to learn. So that we might even just be able to tell people one good thing about him. About his goodness, about his love, about his faithfulness, about his mercy, about his grace. About his ability to set us free from the things that have been hounding us for generations. That in him curses die. That in him there's life and life eternal. That I don't have to worry about if I go out and get in a car accident where I'm going to be tomorrow because I'm going to be with him today. And for those of you with pain in your body, It's not about the when you'll be set free from the pain. Because you were. Everything associated with being a slave is back there. Pain's associated with being a slave. Labor, hard labor. We have victory. And that's a part of Jesus' name is victory. Victory. What do you need victory over? You know. That's what he died for. To give you victory. To give you victory, Charlie. Because he's not done yet. He's not done with anybody in this room. Victory is a constant in our lives. I want to drive that home real quick. Victory is a constant in your life. You don't win some and lose some. You don't win some days and lose some days. You are always in victory. It doesn't come and go like the wind. You know, one, one thing I didn't get a chance to touch on in here was Jesus saying, you know, the, the wind blows as it, as it does and you see it. And the Holy Spirit moves the same way. 
The Holy Spirit is always about people. Moving on people, moving through people, moving people. He's there to give to you everything that Jesus purchased. Be victorious. You can't lose. Even if you try to. That's why he was lifted up. And then he was given special delivery from heaven for everyone. And that series of verses ends with, and then there's no condemnation. There's no guilty verdict over your life. So if I'm not guilty, I'm victorious. And that's the strength of Jesus. And that's the strength of salvation. It's lifted up to lift you up. It's given so you can receive and there's no condemnation with it. Fit for use. Regardless of the quality of your life. And you might look at the quality of your life and say, man, this thing needs to be over quick. <laughs> but God is just up there stamping your life fit for use. Next page, fit for use. Next page, fit for use. Go in his strength. Stop depending on yourself. Go in his strength. Nicodemus left a conversation he was hoping to dominate with nothing left to say. When you leave God's presence, leave with nothing left to say. Just thank you.